Amendments. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Islam in Focus. Be sure to catch us Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 10.30 on the following networks. Rogers Channel 129, Bell Express View Channel 217, and Star Choice Channel 348. Today we have with us Sheikh Hasnain Rajbali from Dearborn, Michigan. He is a visiting lecturer and has lectured in several centers. He also has participated in several interfaith gatherings around the world. Welcome back to the show, Sheikh Hasnain. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, for this segment, I would like to discuss the 12th Imam. And to start us off, I would like to ask, who is the Mahdi? And do other faiths believe in him or believe in something similar? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, the Mahdi is, is a title that's given to the one who is the guide, uh, the one who protects the interests of uh, the believers. Uh, and it is a concept that is generally believed among all religions in some way or form or shape. The, the, especially the, no, the notion of the messi messianic notion of the coming of a redeemer who is going to bring justice and peace on earth is a universal principle accepted by most religions, most major religions. So uh, we believe in him obviously as the twelfth Imam uh, as the one who is in occultation alive among us and he is God's representative on earth. Now one might say well this is an unusual concept considering that yes there is the Mahdi concept but how is it that he has been alive for 1200 plus years? Um, this is very unusual compared to other religions. And the Jafari school of thought uh, particularly adheres to this notion and hence they are known as the Ithna Ashari, the believers in the 12 Imams, is clear because the Messenger of Allah assigned that by the command of Allah. And this is not a secret, even in other schools of thought that the Prophet said, after me there will be 12 Khalifas over you. And, um, and it is in continuity with that. So Allah, Allah assigned 12 reflections of the Holy Prophet, the Imams. And each one, within their period of time, explained what the Messenger taught us. So the Imams, the job of the Imams is to protect the city of knowledge. Hence the famous hadith of the Prophet where he says, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Ali Babuha. I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. That gate is the protector, the one who guides and the one who directs people as to how to extract from the city of knowledge. So hence Imamat is a continuation of the Prophet, though there is no Nubuwa after that. Meaning when the Messenger completed his message, when he left this world, he was the last prophet, the sealer of prophets, and there are no more prophets after him. But it is logical that since the prophet came and for 40 years he was silent as a prophet, and then he declared his prophethood at the age of 40, and he had 23 years to distribute the message, the final message. And remember, very important, Islam did not start 14 centuries ago. Islam was completed as a religion 14 centuries ago. Islam started with Adam as the first prophet and the prophets received the revelations over time and the Holy Prophet was the one who completed the message. Now within that span of 23 years to impart a complete religion and to change the mentality of the people who were mostly pagans, who were believers in idols and to change their lifestyles and to complete them with the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the religion of Islam, 23 years if you really do the math is a very short period of time. And now take into consideration that of the 23 years, 13 years of that, the Holy Prophet was subjected to oppression in Mecca. He wasn't really given the freedom to express. So he had a very small group of followers. So that's 13 years are gone. You're left with 10 years. Of the 10 years, roughly 8 years, he was defending Islam because the enemies kept attacking him. So whenever, after he moved to Medina, the enemies from Mecca and other regions kept attacking him. So those attacks kept coming and he was defending them. Hence he had to go on the battlefields and defend. Which leaves roughly two to three years of peaceful time. Now the final religion coming unto mankind through this, the greatest human being who is the Holy Prophet 
to give him a period of three to four years, let's say maximum, let's say even if you take all the free periods, it's nothing to explain and to express this message of Islam to the people and to understand the diversity of how to approach the law. And Allah's wisdom through this is that when the messenger left at the age of 63, the Imams come into play where now they are a reflection, a pure reflection of the Holy Prophet. Their knowledge base is similar to the Prophet and they reflect the Prophet. So when people ask them questions, they would say exactly what the Prophet intended within that time. So we know our Imams up to the 12th Imam in the sense of his, from his birth was roughly 250 years plus or minus, you know, actually 250 years plus. So 250 years of a period of reflection makes more sense where you have a prophet being reflected to describe and express and teach the people the message over a span of 250 years. And hence the 12 Imams. Now, when our 12th Imam came into play, in the, came into, into this world and as an Imam, you find that the, the Abbasid Caliphate was very, very um, staunchly afraid of this Mahdi because they knew, historically the Prophet said, that my grandson who shall have my name, because Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, as you know, his name is Muhammad also, Ibn al-Hasan. So uh, you find that he will establish justice and he will break the shackles of dictators and uh, oppressors. So the Abbasid Caliphate was afraid of that because they knew that the Mahdi will, will straighten them out from their evils. And therefore they wanted to beat him to the punch to kill him. And hence you find that the Imam went into hiding at a young age, at, the age of, uh, at a very young age, five, uh, and he went into occultation. And there was a minor occultation and then there was a major occultation. And that occultation was Allah's decree. Now someone may ask, why is the Imam under occultation under these long periods of time? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keeps his representative on earth, even if you can't see them. Just like shaitan, Iblis, is uh, the antithesis of good upon us, and Allah warns us of his evil machineries, uh, and uh, evil thoughts, but we can't see him. By the same token, Allah is balanced, is just, that there's always a khalifa on earth, in nija'ilun, Khalifa, and that's really the Mahdi according to our perceptions. Um, what are some of the signs of his reappearance? Are any of them occurring at the moment? Well, there are many signs, and unfortunately, there are some signs that you really can't validate. But in the general sense, we know of what will happen, uh, and it's all interpretive. There are those who interpret who interpret signs in various ways, uh, but one of the clear signs is that oppression will reign, there will be a lot of oppression, a lot of death taking place, a lot of injustice will be taking place. And if we examine the world today, it is indeed the case. There's a lot of oppression taking place today, especially among those who follow the ways of Ahlul Bayt, particularly in countries like Bahrain, for example. You find the world is turning a blind eye to their cause, uh, you know, because of political reasons. And unfortunately, so many lives are being lost, so many women are being abused, that unfortunately, that's the, the reality. So one of the signs is that, that there will be a lot of oppression in the world, a lot of deaths taking place, earthquakes will be taking place, floods will be taking place. And that's, we're seeing that happening now. Japan is a good example. You find uh, even in Indonesia recently that took place, all the, the tsunamis that hit that part of the region. Uh, the earthquakes in Iran, the earthquakes in China, the earth earthquakes in Japan, you're noticing tremendous amount of deaths taking place. So that's, those are natural disasters taking place, and at the same time, the battles and the wars that are taking place, the invasions of invading armies, causing all kinds of uh, horrible deaths uh, among people, poverty, it's, it's at an alarming rate. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the divide is getting wider. All of these are signs of the reappearance of Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, you talked about um, his occultation, how he went into hiding. When did the minor occultation occur and when did the major occultation occur? Well, he was at the age of five, you know, 255 AH, uh, you know, the occultation. And then you find that um, roughly 60, 70 years later, 
there was the, the major occultation that took place. And um, the, the, the minor occultation was that he was in communication with four representatives on earth, which he appointed. Uh, two of them were actually father and son, and they were just four people who were the direct representatives of, of the Imam, who essentially became the means by which the people would communicate with the Imam. That was the minor occultation. And then the major one, there were no representatives thereafter. And the major occultation has taken place since then. So roughly, um, you know, if you want to do the math, it would be roughly 1,200 years of, of major occultation. So the occultation, of course, has principles and meaning behind it. But uh, the imam was showing us how to be independent in ijtihad and that we as uh, a group of believers and even Surah Al-Bara'at, Allah mentions that a few of you should go and learn and, and study the law and come back and guide others. This is a commandment in the Qur'an. And this is really where the true principles of ijtihad start to take uh, formation and it flowers over time. So this is why we have our maraji, for example, who represent the leadership in the levels of ijtihad. And that became possible after the occultation. And the Imam, our Imam, present Imam, um, showed them the guidelines, the basic guidelines. Um, and ijtihad, of course, is the process of learning and studying the law uh, from the Quran and from the Prophet Sunnah. And, of course, the reflection of Ahlul Bayt as to what did the Ahlul Bayt say regarding what the Prophet say, regarding what the Quran says. Um, one of the conditions of his reappearance is that people have to sincerely pray for him to come and they have to connect with him. In this day and age, our schedules are so busy and everything is just, we just don't have that much time to do it. So how can we make sure that we make time for this noble cause? Well, regardless of his reappearance or not, one should sincerely pray to God. I mean, that's an obvious scenario. Even if the Imam was present among us, no one can say that we should not be sincere in prayers. Allah even addresses the, the, the importance of sincerity of prayers, that even those who reject Allah, when they are in a state of difficulty, particularly about to die, you find that they will pray to Allah sincerely. Allah says, when the waves are covering them and they're about to drown, Allah says they call on their Lord sincerely. But when we bring them back to shore, they take the middle ground, and like as if they had no problems, and they reject Allah's signs. So we all need to pray sincerely whether the Imam is going to reappear or not. And I don't think that is a condition for the reappearance of our blessed Imam. I don't believe so. We say that, and it's a good thing to say, but I don't think that's a condition. The real condition is when Allah decrees it, <clears throat> that's the condition. None of us can, can create that condition. Our condition in this world is to change the affairs of our society for the better. Allah says, In Allah, la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusim. Allah does not change the affairs of a community until the community changes themselves first. So that's a requirement regardless of when the Imam is going to reappear. And on Judgment Day, if we don't participate in bringing harmony within the society, we will be liable, even if the Imam didn't show up in our lifetime. But we need to make an effort to prepare the way for the Imam. And that means to establish justice and equity, so that when the Imam appears, we will join him readily, because we will already in motion, will be in motion to be doing the good things. We won't just be sitting around waiting for his instructions. We will have already started and he will join in and sort of be the catalyst to take us into higher stages of existence. So we all need to prepare ourselves for the Imam. We don't know when the Imam will reappear. No one knows. Allah says, Inna Allah inda ilmu sa'a. To Allah is the knowledge of time. The day of judgment is Allah's. The reappearance of the Imam is, the, is Allah's strict uh, knowledge. We do know the signs. And we see what's happening in the Middle East today, North Africa especially. We see that these are signs, and they are very unusual signs that haven't happened historically. And it's happening so rapidly, especially with the computer age that we live in, 
that knowledge is being imparted, information is, is exchanging hands at, at millisecond levels, which is unusual. It's never happened before in history. So we are pretty confident that something is around the corner, but it would be foolish for anyone to say for sure it is around the corner because that would imply knowledge of something that we don't have knowledge of. We can say that probably, pro uh, probability-wise, there's a higher chance of his reappearance. And one might say, well, what if the Imam doesn't show up? The argument is simple. Even if he doesn't show up for a thousand more years, or a million more years, it's irrelevant. The relevancy is in the intadar. As the Prophet said, he says, أَفْضَلُ الْعِبَادَ إِنْتَدَارُ الْمَهْدِي One of the, the most uh, supreme forms of ibadah is intadar of the Mahdi, to have this desire for the representative of Allah, because he is a means by which we remember Allah, and Allah mentions that in the Quran, the shafa'a, the representatives are the means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're waiting for them, you want to remember them, that's part of ibadah, just like no Muslim can claim to be a Muslim without remembering the Prophet. The Holy Prophet is a means to Allah, I cannot claim to be a Muslim by saying there is no God but one. And if I don't say that the Holy Prophet is the sealer of prophets and the last messenger, if I don't say Shadun Muhammad Rasulullah, I'm not a Muslim. So by the same token, Intadar al Mahdi is on the same line that that reflection of the Prophet within our time is essential and we have to remember the, the Mahdi. So our Intadar of the Imam should therefore make us to submit to Allah properly, to hold on to prayers, to keep our prayers, to give charity, to forgive people, to be just, not to lie and cheat, and to take account before Allah takes our account. That's a moral individual, a good human being. And that to me I think is, is pivotal in why all these hadith are like the way they are. Some people think, okay, when the Imam is about ready to come, I'm going to shape up. And I say that's foolish. You don't know when you will when the Imam is going to show up. It's just like somebody says, when Malakul Maut comes to my house to take my soul, I'll shape up. Well, no one knows when Malakul Maut is going to catch you. He may catch you in the middle of the highway while you're driving, while you're sleeping. There's no guarantee as to when you'll be caught. So why not prepare before you get caught? And the same with Imam Mahdi. When people ask me, what should I do to prepare for Imam Mahdi? I always tell them, prepare for Malakul Maut. If you can prepare for the angel of death, you're ready for Imam Mahdi. Um, what state will this world be in before his reappearance? A terrible state, as we know. The world, the injustice will be there. Look at the world today. Look at the amount of injustice. It's mind-boggling how humans are being used as slaves and they're just being steamrolled only because of some political powers and some people who want power. That's all. It's, it's mind-boggling how much thievery, theft of land, people's lives, lives are just considered like nothing to some people. They shoot them at, you know, for, for fun. You've seen cases like that of invading armies, just shooting children just for fun, for target practice. It's horrible. At least there was a time when you had to shoot an arrow. You had to take a sword and get to a person. Now you can detonate a bomb sitting in a, in a room and you send a drone out, a plane, you know, it's, it's carrying all kinds of artillery and bombs and you're bombing cities and people, destroying lives. You don't even feel it. You're sitting in a room and all you're seeing is just on the radar screen, yes, it's like a little game that people are playing, you know. You play a game and you're destroying countries and cities and planets like it's nothing. All you just see is like a little red flash. You say, okay, that's gone. Let's move on. No emotions. It's a horrible state of world that we're living in today. Really, if we think about it, it's, 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 a, it's a pathetic state considering how civilized we should be. At the rate, you know, and we say, well, it's population control. There's seven billion of us and in the next ten years we will probably be doubling that, you know. Oh, so we need to have population control. Well, it's very nice to say that. How about you get taken out as population control? Of course, nobody likes that. So you always want to take the one who's got no power to raise his finger or, you know, or voice against you. Well, this is very, uh, this is very unjust. And that's what's happening in the world today. So I pray that this justice prevails in the world and everybody lives harmoniously. Muslims and non-Muslims, everybody has a human right to live harmoniously, to practice their religion the way they want it. Nobody should impose a religion on anyone else. I don't think this is God's desire, nor is it a condition. Quran says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even allow two identical twins to agree on everything, genetically, though they're identical, they don't agree with everything. 
This is how Allah created the world. Who are we to enforce that everybody should agree on one idea? So inshallah when Imam Mahdi comes, there's a riwayah to show that he will judge the people by their religions. Christians will be judged by their law. Jews will be judged by their law. Hindus will be judged by their law. Now the beauty is when you start really judging them by their law, the people will feel the burden of their own law and they will change from that position, which will bring them to the right law. There will be no compulsion in religion. The compulsion will come from their self-centeredness of thinking of that they are right. Allah will say, okay, then this is what your law says. This is how we're going to, we're going to treat you. They won't like it by your own law. So when Imam Mahdi والسلام, reappears, the same will happen. There will be minimal bloodshed. And yes, the strategic enemies will be removed. At the cost of them shedding blood, yes, but minimal. Um, where will the reappearance take place? Historically from Ruwayat, we know that he will reappear at the Kaaba in Mecca on Friday. And in fact, it is so... This history is so authentic that even those who are controlling that region now are very much afraid of Fridays uh, because they know when he reappears many things will change and they, they may not be too happy about it but we want justice at any cost. So he will reappear at the Kaaba. Um, what will the time period be like when he's ruling? When he's ruling the Messenger of Allah said that the majority of the world will be just and the minority will be unjust. Evil will be a minority and justice and goodness will be the majority. So that's a, that's a beautiful thought. Today you find that a lot of injustice is my majority. People in power are siphoning money for their own pockets. Nepotism is very popular where leaders are just protecting their own interests, their own tribes. And if you don't belong to any particular tribe, you get marginalized. People's justice today is being taken, and no one can say a word. Uh, the rich are elite few, the, the majority are poor, but it'll flip the other way around. The majority will be well off, and a minority will be poor. There'll be the majority of the world will be middle class. Um, you know, and even those who are wealthy will be very generous in, in sharing their wealth. So that will be the, the state of affairs when Imam Mahdi salam comes. Uh, there will be majority happiness, people will be content, uh, the misunderstandings in religion will be eradicated. Even today there's a lot of misunderstanding about religion, about God, about the justice of God. And it's because humans have intervened in creating their own stories which, have, which has led to many people to misunderstand religion. The Imam will correct that and explain the Qur'an the way it should be explained. Um, are there any supplications that we can recite in order to hasten his reappearance? Well, we have many du'as, as we know. We uh, du'a faraj, we recite, you know, and so many different du'as where we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten his reappearance. Um, they say, Surah al Ben Israel, the 17th chapter, uh, is a very good surah to recite that uh, brings about closeness to the Imam and hopefully that will be a means by which to hasten because that particular surah has many issues that covers about the prevailing situations of uh, the coming of the Imam. In fact, one of the profound verses, Allah says, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ Every man on that day will be raised by their Imam. Uh, in Surah Al-Qasas, Allah says, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْعَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّ وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ This verse, they say, when Imam Mahdi السلام, was born, he recited this to his father, Imam Hassan al-Askari, as a baby. وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْعَرْضِ It is our desire to make you the oppressed, the inheritors of this earth. This is also in the biblical scriptures, by the way, the meek shall inherit the earth, meek meaning the oppressed. And we will make you leaders. We will make you leaders. We will make you the inheritors. And that's a, that's a command of Allah that is decreed which will happen. And we're all waiting for that. That we should 
the people of who are the oppressed, the ones who are who should be leaders, the ones who should lead the world with equity and justice, should be the ones who should inherit the authority of the world. And the Quran guarantees that, that that will happen. So there are many du'as we can recite. But I think more than any du'a, if we practice goodness, that's the greatest du'a possible. I really feel that uh, du'a is extremely important. And it is a means by which we reach higher stages. And we should recite du'a. The Quran is filled with du'as, with the naqul, you know. Uh, and what did they recite? Uh, even the ashab kaf people of the cave, when they were being oppressed by the, the Roman king of the time, they recited, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَحَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا That, oh Allah, put mercy upon us and make our affairs correct. These du'as are essential for us to, to prepare the ways for the coming of our Imam. Um, can we see him even though he has been hidden from us? Some people argue that since he's in Ghaybat al-Kubra, you know, that it's impossible to see him. Others argue, no, he is visible and he can be seen. I am ambivalent about that issue. I do feel that his uh, visibility is definitely possible and it's obvious and it's logical. To insist that because he's in Ghaybat al-Kubra that he should never be seen, I don't, I, I'm not convinced about those arguments. I mean, it sounds right, but I don't think that's really essential. Even Iblis is in Ghayba, but he is seen under strict conditions, you know, prophets used to see them. So I don't think that that is a requirement necessarily. So I do believe he can be, but uh, in the general sense, we see him through his transactions. And uh, he, if he does get seen, then it is not something that you would recognize until after the, the case. Because th their, their goal is not for you to recognize who they are, their goal is to guide us in the right direction. And I do believe that that does happen, yes. Okay, well, thank you for being with us today. And inshallah, we'll see you, on, we'll see you in the future. Inshallah, thank you very much. If you have missed any shows, please visit www.islaminfocus.org. See you next week. Welcome to a new world of booking travel, the lowest airfares, discounted holiday packages, cruises, customized group tours, and a whole lot more. Introducing to you a leader in the Canadian travel industry for over 25 years, an award-winning consolidator for over 50 airlines, over 2 million tickets sold, and the lowest international airfare guarantee, Gala Travels, a name you can trust. GalaTravels.com, always giving you more. Fitness. It's yet another day Feeling all alone Without your presence I just can't go on My eyes are searching For you everywhere after the end of the Friday prayer O son of Hassan, my beloved Imam 